All right, good afternoon. Uh, we made it through the, through the week. Uh, so today, uh, we're gonna talk about Kubernetes networking, but an infrastructure offload for Kubernetes networking. So we've uh, assembled a panel of uh, folks from different areas to talk about how do we uh, even just define what it means to do an infrastructure offload, and how do we do that infrastructure offload in lots of different contexts? Are we doing an infrastructure offload uh, in the public cloud? Are we doing it inside uh, uh, of a cluster that I've built uh, on premise? Uh, or are there some combinations of those two that we want to be doing this, this offload in? And so we're going to be talking about infrastructure offload from lots of different perspectives. Uh, we have two presenters who weren't able to make it. Uh, and so midway through, we're going to show uh, a short video uh, uh, of, of their uh, presentation. Uh, but uh, uh, we will uh, introduce each other as we go through. And I'm uh, Dan Daly from Intel, uh, and I work on uh, software architecture, and I work on a, a new project uh, called IPDK, which is now also part of the Linux Foundation and is part of a, a larger umbrella uh, effort called Open Programmable Infrastructure. So Open Programmable Infrastructure uses that infrastructure word. It's really generic of a word. What do we mean in this context? When we're talking about infrastructure in this case is that we are taking the business logic or the worker uh, logic that's running and we're going to provide certain services. Uh, <laughs> again, another overloaded word. We're gonna provide certain functions to that worker node. Uh, and in the case of infrastructure, we're thinking of it at a baseline as infrastructure as a service. So I'm going to provide it a little bit of networking, a little bit of storage, Maybe there's a little bit of acceleration that we're providing. So we're providing these uh, 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 sort of basic uh, abstractions that you would get from a cloud. Uh, and we call all of that infrastructure and we group it together. And so uh, when we want to talk about software-defined infrastructure, that's what we mean. It's software-defined networking, software-defined storage, uh, all grouped together as one. And so uh, in this uh, space of uh, programmable infrastructure, we're trying to define the, the dividing line between what is the business logic, what is the what is the function running in your pods that is you know doing the real work at hand, versus what is the logic underneath it that is supporting it to secure it, uh, connect it, uh, these types of things, and. Why are we creating this new separation? Is because you know we think that this abstraction, uh, uh, which has already been you know really useful in infrastructure as a service, gives us a bunch of great features that we can then apply to Kubernetes networking. So the first one is the idea of having a gap uh, for security reasons between your logic that's running and all of the other logic that's supporting it, and we call this the air gap. But uh, when this is implemented uh, using hardware functions, then we can give hardware isolation to uh, the, the work logic uh, uh, running inside a server. Uh, the second functionality that we're looking for is to be able to start moving tasks that may be using uh, cycles, creating latency or jitter, uh, or just sort of getting in the way of things uh, that's currently running alongside your work, work logic and uh, pushing it into the infrastructure. And, uh, you know, uh, initially to save cycles, but you start to get to the third and fourth value, which is once you've pushed that task out of the, the work CPU into the infrastructure, you can now re-implement it more efficiently. Maybe you implement it in really optimized software. Uh, maybe you implement it in hardware which is something that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, and then in the, in the, the fourth value is once you can re-implement the infrastructure with a separate sort of cadence than uh, the, the software being loaded on the work side, you can now add features to the infrastructure a lot uh, more quickly. So maybe you wanna change the way uh, the networking policy works, or if you wanna add a new sort of construct around how your storage is accessed, 
or you want to add computational storage, you know, uh, combine the two of them, that, that feature velocity is enabled by that abstraction because you've pushed all that, that uh, extra stuff that uh, isn't, isn't uh, generating revenue and you've given it to the infrastructure who can now go in and, and innovate uh, at a separate cadence. So that's why we're, we've, we've created this abstraction. And so uh, now I'm gonna pass it to Nabil, who's gonna talk a little bit about uh, the, 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 the types of things that he's looking for as a customer uh, looking to do infrastructure offload. Thank you, Dan. Um, so we'll talk about uh, what is IPUDP offload and some goals and requirements uh, that uh, we're looking to achieve from that. So first, let's talk about what we mean by uh, offload uh, from a networking point of view. So this is usually uh, mainly it targets really the offload of uh, data plane processing functions from the host CPU to the hardware NIC. That's what relational offload meant. And these NICs usually have been called smart NICs or performant NICs, and they went by that name. With the infrastructure uh, data processing unit uh, or data processing units, IPUs, DPUs, those are considered as evolution from the smart next and, uh, and uh, the performance next to include comp uh, really uh, a compute uh, uh, complex which compose of CPU and memory. Uh, in addition to ASIC FPGA, usually for the fast packet processing depending on the, the implementation. The goal in here is usually to improve scale uh, so you could have dedicated memory that allow you to have larger FIB, larger set of policies and so forth, to have better performance and support additional capabilities. Uh, because you, now you have the compute uh, complex, you could run control plane functions on the IP, DPU, and that uh, CPU memory complex. Um, you could support additional capabilities like storage networking that some of the IP, DPUs are supporting. We could move load balancing functionalities and so forth uh, to the IP, DPU. Uh, as examples, if you're aware of what's going on in the market, there are multiple such NICs available today on the market. Uh, from Intel, this is the Intel IPU uh, that, uh, that has been announced, I believe, not long ago. Uh, the NVIDIA DPU, and there is uh, Pensando AMD, and this is only to mention examples, right? Not to bias for these. So what are, what are the objective in doing so? Uh, obviously, uh, the objective will be to improve performance, and performance is really measured usually by latency and, uh, and throughput uh, that could be achieved on the host. Um, some applications also require very low jitter as well. You could, you could try to achieve that. The other one is improved security, as then touched on, is really provided via the isolation of the infrastructure from the host. So if the host gets compromised, for example, uh, that you're protected from that because you're running on the infrastructure uh, processing unit, uh, such the IPU, DPU. And the other one is really to improve the overall efficiency uh, from power point of view and increasing compute density uh, in the center that, uh, that you'll have. And the way to achieve that is because you're freeing up what will be spent in CPU cycle in doing packed processing, such as doing forwarding, policy enforcement, load balancing, and so forth, you're saving those CPU cycles by offloading that functionality uh, to the IP, DPU, and you're freeing up for application processing, and that's what the CPU jam purpose CPUs are really built for. It is really application processing. And the other one is really by doing so, you're leveraging the IP do for networking, where the purpose-built ASIC usually or fast data path is being implemented to, to do the packet processing is in the most efficient way. That's how you get to the efficiency. So what are the goals and requirements? Obviously in here, uh, we've been talking about offloading the data plane processing functions uh, to the IPU, DPU. So examples of that will be uh, to have the state of the data plane, such as Fed policies and so forth, maintained on that, on the IP, DPU. Uh, you could have uh, Fed as a state and the, 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 the routing functionality, if you will, or the forwarding functionality as an action that's taken in the pipeline. Similar could be said on policies. You could have the policy states, meaning firewall rules, that are maintained as state. And then you could have the policy enforcement function done on the IP do as an action and so forth. I don't want to go through the list, but just to give you a flavor, there are many things that could potentially be uh, implemented on the IP DPU. The other goal is to really to have an industry uh, standard abstraction layer for the hardware so that we could allow ease of integration between different solutions, whether coming through open source projects and or proprietary solutions from vendors with third party hardwares that are providing or hardware vendors, uh, hardware that are providing IPU, DPU solutions as well. And there is uh, an open source initiative that's being targeted for that. 
From control plane aspect, uh, there is a goal in here to really look at optimizing the control plane for both compute and networking uh, to be fitting better to the IP DPU, DPU paradigm. And that has not been really considered before, and I'll talk about a potential way to get that uh, at a high level from architecture point of view. So what, what is this really? Uh, is really to look at what is needed for the control path between the compute and network controllers to the host, uh, and then how to offload the control or distribute the control plane function between the host CPU uh, that's on the server host and the IP DPU on the same server host, and how to interrelate or coordinate the control plane between them. The target is also, although in here we're in the Kubernetes uh, conference in KubeCon, uh, the target in here to be able to support the IP UDP in mul for multiple compute endpoints that could include bare metal. So there are many applications that run on bare metal uh, to support also compute endpoints that could be virtual machines, and there are many ap such applications, or to support really uh, pods or container endpoints that could be running work nodes that could be either bare metals or VMs. That's kind of the, the scope of this. So I want to go through this diagram. It could take a lot of time to go through that by itself. But to illustrate what we mean by, uh, by uh, data plane functional distribution, as well as uh, control plane function distribution, so overall functional distribution between the IPU and DPU, you could imagine a server or a host in general that has two main blocks. That is the host, uh, the host CPU and its memory complex, which is the upper part in blue. And then you could have the IPU DPU as another NIC card plugged into the same server host. Now, that IPU DPU usually will have its own CPU memory complex, as we talked about, and will have hardware acceleration for the data path function that could be implemented via ASIC and FPGA. That's kind of the setting of this. Now, when we talk about, uh, the, the, again, the distribution of functionalities, the one path that could be looked at is that today, if you have an SDN controller or, uh, or a Kubernetes controller, they'll interact with, uh, with equivalent control functions, if you will, that are run on the host CPU. So offloading that to the IP DPU so that the control path could come from the controller, let's say the network controller, to an agent sitting on the IP DPU that will interact with the, with the centralized control plane. And with, via the offload function, it will learn, for example, policies, routes, and so forth, if they're coming through it, or from a local routing engine that could be running on the IP DPU, and will go and program the, the, the data path, which will be on the ASIC FPGA uh, via different relay adapters or, or drivers uh, to do that. There are many functions that could be implemented via that offload, whether in, in programming state, uh, as well as programming probably the pipeline, as well as getting data from the fast path, such as stats, flow logs, and so forth that would be gathered via that. The other function in here is that in coordinating with the, with the uh, with the host CPU, that how does the offload engine that's running on the IP DPU will contain to splice the data path, if you will, with the containers that are running or the pods that are running on the host CPU. So there is interaction that has to go on between the offload uh, control block that's, uh, that's shown in this diagram and the onload control block that's running on the CPU to really create the necessary interfaces, whether as SRIV interfaces or to do the programmability of the virtual Ethernet port that could be related to the pod and so forth to create the data path that comes from the pod through the host, on the host CPU, through the IP DPU, and back to the, to the ASIC, which will basically be interfacing with the physical NICs, or to route traffic between, between two pods on the, same, on the same host CPU. So everything will be going via a trusted path, which is related to the infrastructure represented by the IP DPU, rather than being exercised, if you will, whether maintaining state, like such as policies, or enforcing that state for the policy on the host CPU will be done on the IP DPU. Now, I'm not gonna delve into the control path for the compute, but you could, you could think about that also going through a trusted interface, if you will, meaning it could come from centralized uh, uh, Kubernetes controller, and what we call the Kubernetes master, and it could go also through IP DPU, and through the agents, I'll call it agents for now, that's offload and onload, you could trigger the, the creation, if you will, of the, of the pods uh, via, the run, on the, via the, the runtime engine on the host CPU. So the idea in here, again, to create isolation between the host where your workload is executing and the infrastructure where policies, routing, and so forth is being enforced and do the coordination between the two. That's an example of what we could do done at a high level. And that's what we're looking really to start examining that and what the work that needs to be done in that space. So thank you. Thank you. 
thank you, Nabil, for scoping requirements. Um, my name is Valas. I work for Google, and I'm going to talk briefly of how we meet these requirements, or how far away we're from meeting them. Um, so if you look today at uh, public clouds, and I'm mostly to talking about Google, is that um, public clouds today offload uh, VPC networking to uh, IP UDPU. So we already have offloads, right? And uh, if you look at the features that we offload today, um, if you try to enumerate them, it's usually routing, uh, policy routing, or some people call it service chaining, um, internal, external load balancing, security policies, etc. If you then look at the set of features that Kubernetes networking implements, it's, we call them sometimes differently, but they are very similar, which is you know, pod regibility, cluster IP, node port, external IP, network policies, observability. So there is a lot of overlap between them. And so can we actually then offload these Kubernetes uh, networking features? Perhaps to the same infrastructure, we already today offload uh, VPC networking. Well, actually we, at least in Google, we already offload some of the features. It's, it's not very big set, but some important features. So for example, um, two examples that I brought here is uh, pod to pod reachability and uh, intranode observability or visibility. So for uh, pod to pod reachability, we rely on VPC network offloads. Uh, to be able to scale, to reach, uh, uh, to connect large number of pods, and we can run up to 15,000 nodes, of, you know, 200 pods per node, and they're all going to be able to reach each other, uh, even you know during the VM migrations, <coughs> etc. So it's all offloaded in VPC. Uh, for intranode visibility um, in, in GKE, we have this feature where we can punt the traffic, even the ones that's between pods. We could configure uh, to punt the traffic to go through the hypervisor. And so it's not a Kubernetes feature per se, but uh, in terms of observability, uh, you can effectively get observability features that you get in VPC. You can, get, uh, you can essentially get visibility now what happens between your pods, even if they're running on the same node. Um, so that's the, that was the current state, but uh, GKE still relies uh, heavily on onloaded implementation for most of uh, Kubernetes networking. So you know we run QProxy or Data Plane V2, and it's all running inside the node and using either IP tables or eBPF. So why do we do that? Well, time to market, uh, familiarity, uh, resource accounting is an interesting topic where essentially um, the, the users who are heavy, uh, you know, network policy users, they'll be essentially spending their cycles to implement the network policies. But there are very strong tailwinds to offload more. So the sort of set of reasons for that, there's numerous, uh, as, as we discussed in a few previous slides, but uh, one, one couple of things that I, I'd like to hi highlight is, is the maturing offloads for VPC networking, then it gives us time to pay attention to Kubernetes offloads. Uh, one thing that for me uh, personally is the most important is this uh, uh, feature velocity, and we get that feature velocity if we can transparently evolve uh, implementation of Kubernetes networking features independently from the guest OS and guest stack that allows us to roll much faster. Uh, and then two some, somewhat related other reasons is a single data path uh, implementation for doesn't matter which OS you run, whether it's Linux, Linux Windows or BSD containers, and also an opportunity to offer Kubernetes features uh, to, to stacks that currently bypass Linux Windows or BSD kernels such as DPDK, right? and uh, also to lightweight sandboxes such as uh, GVisor. Uh, and also uh, offloading, as we kind of alluded to that, um, brings significant efficiency gains. And that's uh, Moshe's part of the slide. Yes. You know how to put. So with that, I'm going to switch to Moshe Levy from NVIDIA, uh, who is going to present uh, on Infrastructure offload in the in a using a, a, a real cluster of NVIDIA DPUs.
and the sound is not working. Oh, I can hear it. It's just really low. Hello, everyone. My name is Moshe Levy, and I'm exactly at the media. In this part of the panel, we will review NVIDIA DPU solution in Kubernetes. Hello, everyone. My name is Moshe Levy, and I'm a tech lead at NVIDIA. In this part of the panel, we will review NVIDIA DPU solution in Kubernetes. This solution is based on open source project, and it's already used in production at NVIDIA internal projects. In our solution, we use OVN Kubernetes CNI for the Kubernetes networking. OVN Kubernetes CNI is used as OVS uh, and OVN. OVS is a SDN virtual switch. And OVN is a project that provides uh, abstraction with logical switches and logical routers to create a network pipeline uh, for the Kubernetes cluster. Um, uh, let's review the OVN Kubernetes uh, components. So we have OVN Kubernetes master running on the master node, uh, watches on the Kubernetes resources, pods, service, uh, network policies. On the right end, we have the worker node running OVN Kubernetes node, which is uh, doing the net device plan plumbing to the pod and to the OVS. And we have OVN controller, which is translating the OVN logical topology to uh, OVS uh, OpenFlow pipeline. Um, taking a um, closer look at the uh, worker node with the regular NIC, we can see that it uses VTH pair for the networking. The OVS OVN components are running at the worker node. In case of a high packet rate, we will see ICP utilization. And we are limited to a kernel performance. When we're adding DPU to the cluster, um, we are moving to an SRIOV switch dev networking. SRIOV switch dev allows us to create NET device on the worker node to give to the pod, and a peer NET device, which we call a WAF representer, to plug to the OVS. Also, OVS OVN are no longer running on the worker node. They move to the DPU. So all the OVN OVS control plane is now at the DPU level. Also, in case of high packet rate, we will see low performance utilization because all the packet processing is now in the DPU. Also, from a security and isolation perspective, if the worker node is compromised, and the try it cannot tamper with the networking because all the networking control plane is moved to the DPU and the DPU and the master are in the trust domain. And now a little bit on how we do DPU hardware acceleration. So um, we are leveraging, leveraging SRIOV switch dev technology. OVS open source already support SRIOV switch dev. And it knows how to program um, the e-switch on a, when the first packet arriving to the OVS. Um, OVS itself is using standard kernel API. There's nothing proprietary here, which is a TC flower to program the e-switch. In case the hardware vendor doesn't know how to uh, accelerate the packet, um, uh, we will uh, fall back to um, a kernel data path. Uh, this also allows us to reduce the CPU utilization on the ARM cores. And because we're using SIOV and switch dev, we will get low latency and line rate performance. Now we're in a, is a data performance that we run an experiment in NVIDIA lab. Um, here we have, a, we're using XCI as a package generator. We have the host details of uh, the Intel CPUs. On the left side, we have um, OVS running Connectix 6 LX dual port 25 gig VTH. On the right side, we have OVS accelerated with Bluefield 2 um, dual port 25 gig running SIOV. The workload is a test PMD pin to a four CPUs. And because we are doing pod to pod in this case, the data pass is Geneva and connection tracking. And XCI is generating the uh, uh, 500, 500K connections. So we can see on the left side, we are using 32 CPUs 
um, for VSOVM, and the, the right side we are using that because it, now it's all moved to the DPU. Also from a, a throughput performance, on the left side we get 8 gig um, when we're using VTH, and on the right side we get, on the right side we get a, a line rate performance, uh, 50 gig uh, with SRIOV. Also from latency perspective, we get four times late, better latency when using SRIOV. Now to summarize it, so um, with DPU we get uncompromised performance. In case of NVIDIA DPU, we can offload and accelerate all the Kubernetes uh, flows port to port, port to service. We are reducing CPU utilization to bare minimum. From a security aspect, we have networking isolation uh, if the host is tempered. This solution is good for ports, for VMs, and for bare metals. And DPU is a commodity project running a plain Linux. We can run additional services as storage, security, and others. Thank you very much. audio is not working. Uh, so next I will introduce uh, uh, Nupur Jain, who is going to talk about uh, a software project, open source software project on uh, doing Kubernetes offload, really similar Hi. to... Hi, my name is Nupur Jain, and I'm part of Intel IPTK team. Previous presenters have already emphasized on the importance of infrastructure offload and other implementation solutions. Let me go over how we are doing it. To move from the traditional deployment model as shown on the left to infrastructure offload model for various cloud deployment scenarios, we need dedicated interfaces to the parts. With this, we can offload L2 switching, L3 routing, service load balancing, which includes My name is Nupur Jain, and I'm part of Intel IPTK team. To move from the traditional deployment model, as shown on the left, to infrastructure offload model for various cloud deployment scenarios, we need dedicated interfaces to the parts. With this, we can offload L2 switching, L3 routing, service load balancing, which includes CT and NAT functionality, encapsulation, and encryption to our extensible data plane. We added a new P4-based lean data plane to Calico solution. P4 programmability makes the data plane extensible to future cloud use cases and provides for better visibility into flow treatment through counters and stats. Calico supports a broad range of platforms, including Kubernetes and OpenStack, and others for deployment of pods and VMs. It also supports multiple data planes using EPPF and IP tables. Our data plane offers two ways forward for accelerated functionality, for better treat, for better performance and reduce latencies. A software-based data plane, which is implemented using DPDK and a hardware-based solution using IPU. Since control plane components are similar in both of these models and offer a loose coupling for communication using well-defined interfaces, the same control plane works for the above two and other Calico solutions. This helps with interoperability across data center nodes with a mix of accelerated and non-accelerated nodes. Here's the picture that goes a bit deeper into the architecture. The data plane driver is split into two components, agent and a manager, which communicate using gRPC. Agent can be further split up into node agent and infra agent. While manager running on the infrastructure manages the resources, lifecycle of the components and offloads the runtime rules, the node agent receives the CNI calls and adds interfaces to the parts on the host. The infrastructure agent implements the standard REST APIs to watch for Kubernetes resources like pods, services, namespace, and handles events associated with them. It also handles the networking policies for pod traffic isolation and enhanced platform security. Biggest advantage of infrastructure offload is that it offers a secure environment for configuration of resources away from compute where pods are running. It also provides a secure access to other infrastructure provisioning pieces like storage. The scalability performance and reduced latencies while freeing up the host cores are the highlights. 
Because of this kernel bypass, it provides for better feature velocity as well. Here's a running example deployment with our components. As you can see, we have Infras Manager and Infra Agent running as team sets. And together, they are provisioning the DPDK pipeline with rules. Just to show a P4 example of this implementation, we have service load balancing implemented using P4 here. The, uh, this implementation uses connection tracker and that functionality. The very first packet is uh, looked up and it's used uh, to pick one of the endpoints from the service uh, web pool. Once the endpoint has been picked up, the flow is added to connection tracker and the subsequent packets uh, are pinned to the same endpoint uh, and that is applied. To learn more about this implementation and how um, other sample examples have been implemented, please go to ipdk.io, create as in prior offload where we are working on the recipe and you see more additions to existing implementation. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Nupert. And to go back to our presentation here, So to learn more about what she just described, and also there's a demo of the code. You can also download the code and run it yourself at uh, ipdk.io. It's also part of the uh, OPI project which I mentioned earlier, which also has uh, a bunch of code being developed to be able to have uh, consistent interfaces for these different types of DPUs, IPUs, and other acceleration devices. So in summary, we have heard from Folks working in public cloud, we've, we, we have heard from Moshe working on a DPU, we've wor heard from Nupur working on IPU, uh, and there's a lot of uh, commonality in that uh, the, the, the worker CPU, the, the, the job that they're doing should not be changed or modified in any way. This is a function where we're pushing the infrastructure underneath an abstraction so that the, uh, the, the end user doesn't need to worry about it. Uh, there are some things that are required in all of these different solutions. Uh, one thing that Nupur mentioned, and we played that part twice, uh, is the, the need to have a connection to each pod into the infrastructure. So this allows you to uh, apply policy. When you've made that separation, in order to be able to know which, you know, where the pod, where each pod is, the infrastructure needs to have uh, a, a direct connection. And in the case of a DPU and IPU, that can be a hardware secured connection that isolates all of the different pods from each other. And then the second piece that uh, the common piece that's required is to be able to program that infrastructure. And, and, and in some cases, uh, like in Moshe's example, we're able to program it through a new interface, like through OVN. And in other cases, like in uh, Nupur's example, we can use existing Kubernetes APIs and, and copy that state from the worker CPU into the infrastructure to minimize the, the set of changes needed in order to take advantage of this offload. And so, uh, you know, there's different, there's different options and different implementations out there. We want to have that commonality. We want to be able to have commonality across the different ways that you can deploy this technology. Uh, and we absolutely want to be able to allow people to choose different vendors and different implementations depending on, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, what they're looking for. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, I think we're ready for questions. If I understood well, the net, I have two or three questions. The network stack would be in the, in the FPGA, would be, would be programming the hardware? Uh, yeah, so in uh, a couple different examples that we showed today, the, uh, the data plane for the networking is being run in hardware, uh, can also be run in software. And then there is a, uh, it's essentially a choice as to how much of the control plane you want to move off of the worker node. And in, in the case of Moshe's example, the entire control plane was moved off of the worker node and onto the DPU. Yeah. 
And the, the following question with that is, what is the flexibility then to modify the network stack or to fix an error if there is a bug there? And also for functionalities like eBPF. So I would say that you know these are very programmable devices, and they've been designed to be able to uh, uh, you know, understand the, the, the state of the art in terms of Kubernetes networking. Uh, and it's really similar or maybe a, a, a really similar to eBPF in that we're, we're, we're starting with something like an IP tables. And eBPF is an example of using optimized software, but it's keeping it on the worker. Uh, you could use this technology and run that functionality in the infrastructure as eBPF. That would be a, 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 a useful uh, implementation of infrastructure offload as well. Thank you. you want to hit that one? Uh, one, two, three. So okay. just to add, it's, uh, if, if you look at it in the, uh, we already today offload in VPC networking. Um, so it already works and we do roll it out, you know, often and we're able to fix it. Uh, so it is doable, yes. One last question, we are running out of time. I don't know who was first. Who is the next? We only have one question more. We run the, the, the rest of the people can go to, to the mm -hmm. to the to talk to the speakers. Well. So, what, what's the best uh, use case when we should use SIOV, when we should use uh, DPU and uh, DPDK? So, how you compare those three technologies? Ah, so, uh, at least speaking from the Intel IPU, we are. Uh, agnostic as to the type of interface you may want to use, whether it's SRIOV, VertIO, VETH, uh, we're, we're flexible. So we, we support all of those different um, uh, types of interfaces and also supporting them at the same time if you have a primary and secondary network. So it's really uh, a function of, of what you have existing and, and, and uh, what you want your network to look like from the worker CPU side. I, mean, I would say this is probably different uh, optimization that you have to do. For example, if you're running on the host CPU, you don't have to have the bandwidth for hardware acceleration, you don't have the security crime, and then whether using eBPF, as was said earlier, as, as a way to implement probably the data path in a faster way than you would have done in IP tables, you use that. If DPTK will be needed, we'll still be do that. You could still do that. In addition, you could do either on the CPU complex that is on the IPU DPU, because there will be exception packets that will be arriving to IPU DPU that you may need to process, and what we call in networking the slow path, and that could be actually eBPF or DPDK or whatever could be handling that also on the on the uh, on the IPU DPU, but in the slow path, if you will, meaning not in the ASIC, but on the on the ARM complex or whatever the compute complex could be on that. So it's really complementary technologies that exist that have different roles and whatever the environment that you have, you could suit or fit one or the other, depending on what your needs are, so. Thank you again for staying late and uh, getting through our technical difficulties, but uh, yeah, thank you again. Have a good weekend. Thank you.